An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 10, June 26th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in our last session, I began to talk in more detail about the difficulties involved in the relationship of part and whole in the Hegelian philosophy and about how these difficulties might be resolved. In this connection, we discovered that the principal difficulty is this. The particular cannot just be grasped as the particular, rather the particular must always also be grasped from the perspective of the whole, yet both logic and psychology in their current form claim that the whole is never adequately given, but only the parts. We were thus confronted with the problem of how we could anticipate the whole on the basis of which the individual parts must be understood. But in order to resolve this problem adequately, or at least to indicate how the dialectic responds to this difficulty, one which it cannot, of course, mm. simply eliminate. For if it could, there would be no problem of knowledge. The whole really would be immediately given, and subject and object would merely collapse into one. I must get you once again to consider something which will prove challenging as far as widely established habits of thought are concerned. And this is something that we also came up against in our most recent seminar on sociology. For I would like to raise the question whether the whole actually does come afterwards, whether our experience does indeed begin with the parts, and then gradually rise towards the whole. But please do not understand this in the wrong way. I am not speaking in the context, context of the Gestalt theory, or the psychology of perception here, i.e. in the sense that some gestalt or complex is already given, while it is only subsequently through reflection that the individual parts are separated out. Rather, I am thinking about a much more comprehensive and authentically philosophical phenomenon, namely about how our experience is actually organized, that is, about how we actually come by knowledge in the first place. And here it seems to me as if the standard assumption of the logic of scientific investigation, that we first perceive parts, that we then order these parts according to similarities and differences, that we proceed to classify them, and in this way arrive at a universal concept and finally a universal theory, is actually a construction on our part, one which is extraordinarily remote from the actual character of our knowledge, or simply put, from how we actually come to know anything. And there is indeed a question which needs to be thoroughly explored in its own right about how far what is called theory of knowledge really does justice to what we effectively do when we know and how far it more or less presupposes norms which are derived from the sciences and the specific claims to validity which they make but which have relatively little to do with our living experience. Now, science claims, of course, that it must be possible to transform this living experience insofar as it is strictly valid into scientific propositions. But there, but there is also something extraordinarily problematic about this very transformation, and it has never actually been seriously undertaken. Yet our living knowledge consists precisely of innumerable insights whose validity or whose truth if I may put this more emphatically, we also accept, and indeed accept expressly on our own, as a truth proper to ourselves, even if such transformation into scientific propositions proves impossible here. What I am claiming is precisely that in a certain sense, and I am essentially speaking here, like Hegel, with an eye to our social and historical experience, rather than to the specifically organized experience of the sciences that in a basic sense we have more awareness of the system in which we live, that we possess a more direct experience in ourselves of the reality in which we are caught up, than we do of specific individual situations on the basis of which we might gradually ascend to a view or to a concept of the totality within which we live. And the particular or individual aspect on its side is just as much a product of abstraction in relation to the totality of our experience as the whole, and we must critically insist on this as against Gestalt theory, is also in turn a product of abstraction, 
in relation to the individual moments which it encompasses. There is no immediate unity between the two, since the relation in question is a process, and the order which is pursued by science turns things upside down insofar as it would persuade us that the hierarchical classifications it produces, advancing from particular observations to universal concepts, is actually identical with the character of reality itself. This latter thought was first authentically expressed in Spinoza's claim that the ordo idearum idem est ordo rerum, a proposition that seems to me to be idealist in a dogmatic sense, and which we may come back to later in connection with Descartes and the critique, which I which a dialectical perspective must apply to the Cartesian method, which is itself the prototype of scientific method. I am more aware of what kind of world I live in than I am of supposedly individual data. Above all, the moment of oppressiveness, of unfreedom, what contemporary sociology describes with such a neutral expression as social role, namely the orientation of the individual to some particular function, all of these, you may say, relatively abstract things manifest themselves to consciousness in an incomparably stronger fashion than, let us say, specific situations such as parliamentary procedures, or the current business climate, or whatever other social situations we care to consider, the team situation, the family situation, and so on. <clears throat> of course, you may respond here by saying that, from the ontogenetic point of view, if you wish to speak in psychological terms, the paradigm for these relationships must generally be sought in the institution of the family. But even if you would really prefer to foreground the genetic aspect here over against the philosophical aspect, we should still have to say that even a little child does not presumably behave like a little investigator, rising from the experience of a concrete threat on the part of the father to the notion of more general threats. Rather, the child will first experience something like threat as such, namely anxiety, and the supposedly concrete aspect of the specific situation, that father is angry, will only gradually emerge from this. But it is surely the case, if we leave aside these genetic moments and focus upon relations within a fully developed society, that what is actually immediate here, what we first of all perceive, are the general relations much more than the particular relations in which we are involved. Rather, as a dog, for example, will generally react by specifically wagging its tail when well-dressed people enter the room, will act less, will act less excitedly when less well-dressed people come in, and will even start to bark if someone like a tramp appears at the door. I believe that human experience generally organizes itself in such a way Indeed, in this regard, I am deeply convinced that the difference between the human being and the animal is not nearly as emphatic as idealist philosophy would have us believe in order to flatter our narcissism and encourage us to submit to the most unlimited moral demands. If this is so, if this is so, if in a certain rather tacked sense, in contrast to the organized approach of science, we actually become aware of the whole before we become aware of what is more specific, and if what we describe as specific experience is itself already a product of reflection, then we could find a formulation for the dialectical procedure, one which also serves to reveal a particularly dangerous moment of dialectical thought, and specifically of Hegel's thought. For we could say that the task of dialectical thought is to restore the naivety, the kind of perception of the world that we enjoyed before we allowed ourselves to be stupefied by a wholly organized form of thinking, that the task of dialectic, therefore, is to overcome in and through reflection those moments of separation and objectification that have been posited by reflection. I have just suggested that this is a dangerous thought, and indeed when I speak about this danger it is precisely Hegel that I have in mind. For in the work of Hegel, for whom this thought, as I have just expressed it, plays a very significant role. It assumes a particular form on account of his affirmative view of the world, that is, of his belief that spirit effectively wins through, that spirit is absolute and ultimately the only substantial reality. Thus, by means of the dialectic, the naivety which is more or less prior to reflection and the sense of the merely affirmative, 
in the sense of the mere acceptance of given relations, of given positive perspectives, of given religions, effectively comes to prevail, something which finds problematic expression in Hegel's claim that speculative philosophy makes common sense, common cause with religious belief against reflection. And this formulation can be found in these words in Hegel. But it is clear that if we renounce the fundamental conception of identity, which prevails in Hegel, as I showed you in our last session, and replace it with the concept of an open or fractured dialectic, then that kind of demand falls away. But this is surely not the least significant of the motivations behind the dialectic. That thought in reflecting upon itself, in becoming aware of itself, as a means of breaking up and dividing the content of experience, as a dominating moment of pre-formation, nonetheless attempts to dispel the guilt, or at least to prepare the way for this, which thought itself has actually produced. I have said that we first effectively become aware of certain pressure or oppressiveness, that we thereby become aware of the totality before we register more specific aspects. And that situations in this regard may be just as abstract as the whole. And you may well respond that this is merely a relatively vague and unarticulated form of experience, which should not simply be equated with the task of acquiring knowledge, that is, with a genuinely responsible claim to knowledge. I would, of course, admit the justice of this objection, and would claim that the specific significance which theory possesses for dialectical thought is to be found precisely here. That is to say, theory is really the attempt to explore that consciousness of the whole, which is always already there beforehand, and the ensuing specific individual forms of givenness, which are themselves mediated in turn through the whole, and to do so in such a way that they may enter into a certain concordance with one another. And here I shall try to formulate the dialectic for you as a kind of program, a kind of suggestion which you may, God willing, attempt to try out for yourselves if you wish to think dialectically. Thus, on the one hand, dialectical thought must always try and measure up the data with which it is concerned against theory. That is, it must not simply and naively accept them as they initially give themselves out to be, but rather attempt to render them transparent with respect to the whole, which is mediated through theory. On the other hand, dialectical thought must equally keep theory open to those specific experiences by which it is nourished and sustained, and in this regard must equally avoid becoming something merely rigid and definitive. When I try here to elucidate the significance of the whole, or that moment which goes beyond the organized, causal, mechanical, and classificatory conception of knowledge, there are two things which need to be said. Firstly, that we are dealing with a dialectical moment. And once again, I am here translating an important and extremely involved motif of Hegel's, or motif in, of Hegel's, in terms of the simple processes of our own activity of knowing, which is precisely only a moment. It is not the whole, therefore, and you should not imagine that knowledge in its entirety consists of such theoretical anticipations consists of mere theory. If it did consist in this, it would in principle be that which it may always become, something from which it cannot indeed be protected a priori by any power whatsoever, and would simply degenerate into a system of delusion. Furthermore, I would warn you against pursuing something which many, including Richard Croner, have taken at this point to be the essence of the dialectic, namely the, te the temptation of identifying this moment of a comprehensive whole, which is not yet actually present to me as something securely given, with the wretched concept of intuition, quite apart from the fact that this concept of intuition is only really justified to the extent that it is justified at all, precisely as a moment in the process of knowledge, not as something exclusive in its own right. In this context, however, I am not really talking about the kind of articulated philosophy of intuition that was developed by Bergson, where the concept of intuition is transformed and differentiated to a degree, that what I am about to say is not altogether applicable. What I wish to do is to prepare you for the kind of arguments you will repeatedly encounter
as an automatic response whenever you claim any knowledge which goes beyond what we already have in black and white terms and can readily carry home with us. For then you will hear something like this. Ah, oh, yeah, that, ah, oh, yes, that's the moment of spiritual intuition, enormously stimulating. People will say, if they are feeling friendly. But this response also generally betrays a certain hostility, enormously stimulating, but also rather childlike. For although the serious scientist or researcher needs something like this, and there can indeed be no science without such intuition, the whole point of science is to turn these intuitions into small change as rapidly as possible, and, into, and to ensure that everything runs utterly smoothly in the systematically organized context of knowledge. But I do believe that to say something occurs to us testifies to a living experience still at work in us. If nothing strikes us or occurs to us, this generally means we are being stupid, that we have no relationship to the objects of our experience and what is called a merely logical intelligence, one which does not involve that aspect of unanticipated insight is a form of intelligence which simply turns upon itself without enjoying any relationship to the matter itself. But even disregarding all this, it is quite false to take intuition as a specific source of knowledge sui generis, as a special perspective opposed to other forms of knowledge. And I would also say that this was actually Bergson's most serious error in his critique of merely reflective thinking, a critique which he shared with Schelling and indeed with Hegel. It is a strange paradox that Bergson himself, who tirelessly denounced the tendency to divide everything up into categories, and principles of order to think in terms of, com of compartmentalized little boxes and rigid, mechanical and merely classificatory concepts should then have packed the kind of knowledge he held to be truest into a little box of its own and treated it as if it were something utterly separate from the process of knowing in its totality. I believe that this view of intuition is completely mistaken. For what may rightly be described as intuition, if the concept is to mean anything more than it does in the jargon especially favoured by composers of operetta, is a kind of knowledge which lies in the unorganised, and if I may express this for a moment in psychological terms, pre-conscious level of experience, which is then illuminated, as it were, by the ray of reflection that emerges at a certain moment, at the surface of consciousness. At this moment of emergence, it assumes a certain sudden, abrupt, or, if you will, desultory character. But this desultory and disconnected character, which belongs, as the logical positivists would argue, to those despised concepts which are described as intuition, springs not so much from the way that these insights have allegedly fallen from the heavens as from the way. And this is undoubtedly what Bergson actually meant, even if he did not express it so clearly in which it properly captures those moments where living experience or living cognition breaks through the crust of reified and preformed conventionalized concepts and perceptions. This is therefore where we really come to know something, where our thinking is fulfilled, instead of simply feeding off the already given and socially approved view of the object. Then we come to a kind of encounter, a kind of explosion, and out of this conflict springs that sudden and illuminating character of what is called intuition, and which has so often been described to us. But as far as the process of knowledge itself, or if you like, the origin of intuition, is concerned, this is by no means so abrupt. For behind it there actually lies that whole fabric of experiences which transpires in us, and only transpires in a really living way, where we are not compelled to think in a purely controlled manner, where we still preserve something resembling our freedom of consciousness, where our thinking is not already simply directed by the norms which it is supposed to observe. That is what I wanted to say about the concept of intuition in the spiritual sense. To say that the concept of intuition itself can only properly be given a dialectical meaning is just to say that the unexpected character of intuition it's really nothing but that sudden reversal from ossified and objectified concepts into living knowledge which occasionally arises when the concepts from our not yet thoroughly organized or pre-digested experience emerge for reflection. <laughs>
Intuition itself is thus a way in which the object comes to move precisely through the movement of the, concept, of the concepts which lies behind it. This movement certainly does not need to unfold in terms of preformed concepts, and from the psychological point of view, is by no means identical to the clara e distincta perceptio, with which it is generally equated. But I would like to say once again that theory as well as intuition, precisely by virtue of the dialectical character which I have attempted to describe for you here, may not be arrested in turn. For the self-contradictory essence of the object of knowledge is also naturally at work here too. Thus, all theory is open, and to return to the problem with which we began, theory is not to be conceived as something finished either. That is a further difficulty, if not perhaps such a flagrant one, as that we have previously been discussing. On the one hand, to emphasize this once again for you in a rather pointed fashion, I can only come to know the particular insofar as I also have some knowledge of the whole, and measure the particular against this knowledge of the whole. On the other hand, however, this whole is never given to me as something finished or complete either, and as soon as I try and use the whole as something finished and complete, as soon as I simply draw conclusions from it, as they say, then it already turns into something else, or something false. And the whole in turn, as I suggested to you in contrast to the image of a circle and its segments, must be derived in any dialectical theory from the movement of its parts and not from some abstract overarching concept. And in fact, it strikes me as the decisive symptom for the decay of dialectical theory. There where it is declared to be the prevailing view, namely in the countries of the Eastern Bloc, that this dialectical moment is just what has been lost from view. For here the dialectic has actually ossified into a system or a list of theses of a more or less and indeed generally more rigid kind from which the particular is simply derived and on the basis of which above all the particular in every case is judged thus if we consider the entire later work of georgi lucas who must undoubtedly be credited in his earlier years with with reawakening a real sense for dialectical thought in the materialist version of dialectic, we can observe at every stage just how dialectic in its most dogmatic form has prevented just how dialectic in its most dogmatic form has prevented him from reaching genuine dialectic at all, so that we are confronted with a host of value judgments spun out of rigidified concepts simply adopted from the dialectic. We may take a single structure as an example here. Lucas has a theory regarding the ascent and decline of the bourgeois world, and as far as the relationship with art is concerned, the works produced by bourgeois culture in its ascendant phase are supposed to be valuable and outstanding in character. But where bourgeois culture in its decline is concerned, and for Lucas this begins very clearly with Flaubert and Impressionism, everything is simply condemned as inferior very much in the spirit of any old party secretary of the SED, the Socialist Unity Party of Germany. Here Lucas completely forgets the category which he once emphasized so strongly himself, namely that of the social totality. He completely forgets that society continues to develop internally, and forgets above all what he once so dramatically insisted upon, namely that the proletariat as the class which is opposed to the bourgeois class by its exclusion from the privileges of culture and by a series of other factors cannot cannot now be any means by any means be regarded as the most progressive class from an intellectual or cultural point of view thus everything that is substantial intellectually and culturally speaking has been played out in the context of the development of bourgeois society and however critical we may be in relation to bourgeois society, this critique, as far as cultural and intellectual matters are concerned, only really has a relevant object insofar as it explores the internal dynamic of this bourgeois spirit, within which the development of society as a whole, in a certain sense, is also refracted and revealed. But in failing to follow this through, Lucas ends up pronouncing judgments which were typical of the kind of high school teachers from whom my generation, when we were about 15, precisely tried to escape and ends up proclaiming Walter Scott to be a great writer while presenting Joyce and Kafka 
as agents of monopoly capitalism. I think I have therefore shown you, in rather drastic but not, I think, entirely unjust terms, how the ossification of theory, and specifically of dialectical theory, in terms of a living relationship to the object which it would know, proves to be just as false and fateful as any approach which clings immediately to what is supposedly simply given without grasping its relationship to the whole. But let me say more here about the specific difficulties which belong to dialectical thought, and thus pursue my intention of bringing you face to face with the concrete problems of such thinking. I believe that a further challenge presented by dialectical thought, one which will certainly present difficulties to those among you who have been educated in the context of the prevailing logic and theory of science, is, precise, is precisely that thinking of this kind does not proceed step by step, unlike the thinking for which the natural sciences provide the classical model and which we typically encounter in traditional and practically oriented science. Thus, grotesque, grotesque as it may seem, it is precisely dialectical thought, where the various moments are much more intimately connected with one another than they are in the traditional form of thought, which is constantly reproached for being unscientific in the sense that it lacks the requisite systematic character. What underlies this objection is the fact that there is no absolutely first principle for dialectical theory. One could rather say, and this is a critical issue, that Hegel's theory acknowledges an absolutely last principle from which everything flows, namely the fully developed totality, the fully developed system. But it is certainly true that dialectic knows no first to which everything else would have to be would have to be reduced. And thus the dialectic also lacks that pathos of reduction, reduction for which truth, as I once put it, is a merely differential determination or rather a merely residual determination. What is left over once we have deducted all the costs incurred in the process of cognition. On this banal conception, what is left as the net profit of cognition, I am being deliberately basic here, is an absolute first, purified of every contribution of merely subjective conceptual labor and conceptual artifice. Hegel has shown us that an origin is not the truth, that an origin on the contrary becomes a deception the moment it is taken as the truth. It is a deception because it is not an origin at all, and everything that claims to be an absolute first is already mediated within itself. But this already challenges a view which all of you and I myself have absorbed with our mother's milk, as it were, quite irrespective of whether we encountered it in a specifically philosophical form or not. I am talking about the Cartesian doctrine of the clara a distincta perceptio, the view that individual absolutely clear and distinct and mutually independent cognitions constitute the foundations of our knowledge, and that only what can be reduced to such moments can properly count as knowledge. In a German context, due to the influence of Hegelian and idealist philosophy generally, this idea has never become as prevalent as it has everywhere else. And sometimes, indeed, one might regret that this conception, as a moment of truth, has not been more strongly represented, for it is really only through a critique of this idea, and only once we have properly appreciated what the clara a distincta perceptio is, that one can actually make the transition to dialectic in its full significance. Sometimes I have the rather uncomfortable feeling that you are following my dialectical reflections all too readily because the resistance which arises at this point in the whole of the civilized Western world and rests precisely upon a certain Cartesian outlook does not in Germany exert anything like the, like the traditional power that it enjoys here, enjoys there. And in this respect, I would like to say that one can almost arrive at dialectic too easily, and that is probably none too beneficial for the cause of dialectic. Anyway, with regard to Clara A. Distincta Perceptio, we must object that there is no such ultimate and absolute instance of givenness purified of any mediation, whether it be pure consciousness or some pure sensuous datum. The proof of this forms the very content of the phenomenology of spirit, and I wish to introduce this basic thought of the phenomenology into our general presentation of the dialectic here. <clears throat> 
I hope I shall find time to sketch enough of the overall argument of the phenomenology for you to see how this fundamental motive or motif is developed and elaborated there. Wherever thought believes it has now reached an absolute point of rest, this absolute point of rest is once again dissolved until this quest for something absolutely reliable, something that no longer moves within itself, finally reveals itself as a delusive image of knowledge. Truth, as we learn in the course of the dialectic, is by no means something given and is not something fixed, as Hegel puts it. Rather, truth itself is involved in a process, and the object we find before us is itself caught up in movement. And inasmuch as the object is in movement, it is not a distinct or unambiguous object. Or let me say more precisely that it is not only a distinct, distinct object. That is to say, we also require certain distinctness and determinancy in the object. And here the Cartesian moment asserts its rights. We also require insight into specificity, into the object just as it stands before us in its particular contours. And it is precisely by examining this firm and determinate object closely and carefully in its determinacy that we discover it is not such a firm and determinate object after all. It is through the micrological insight which immerses itself in the particular that what is rigid, what is seemingly distinct and determinate, begins to move. And it is this which also exposes the Cartesian claim to critique. You should not forget that this claim derives, in fact, from do dogmatic rationalism. If we think in a philosophical way and work in the positive sciences at the same time, it is quite remarkable to see just how many notions that once played a particular role in the history of philosophy, but have long since been effectively criticized or at least heavily qualified by subsequent philosophy, have still remained extremely influential in the context of the individual sciences which allegedly proceed in a much more rigorous and serious way than we philosophers are thought to do. And among these notions which have been dispelled by philosophy, we find this idea of clara a distincta perceptio, which repeatedly turns up in barely concealed form in the demands raised by the rational and positive sciences. Here we should simply remember that this demand that an object must be given to me in an absolutely clear and distinct fashion and quite separately from others, if I am to possess valid knowledge of it, effectively already supposes, and this is the dogmatic moment of all perception, that the world does in fact possess this character of distinctness and determinacy. That is to say, we can only arrive at this clara a distincta perceptio in the first place, if the objects of knowledge are indeed static, distinct, and clearly delimited in themselves if they are so isolated from all others that they can be separated from the whole and can be treated as individual objects without violating their intrinsic truth. In other words, it is effectively postulated for the sake of science, basically for the sake of a mathematical ideal, in order that we can construct a systematically organized science, that the objects of my knowledge are already such that they present themselves to me adequately under these categories. Now, this is not only a dogmatic claim, for we do not know whether the world is actually organized in this way, but critical reflection on the question of knowledge, and especially Hegel's examination of this question, has shown in detail that this character of objects, which must indeed be assumed if we are to perceive objects clear a distinct, does not exist in this way at all. For objects are dynamic and contradictory in themselves, and precisely by virtue of this contradictory character, are actually bound up with all other objects as well. That is why any knowledge which would proceed in a genuinely rigorous manner, which does not simply reserve philosophy for the Sunday sermon, while operating with healthy common sense throughout the working day, will not attempt to salvage the demand for clara a distincta perceptio.